Christ is coming again. You'll find this promise has been given all the way through the Bible. This evening, Pastor Cox's presentation is on the second coming of Jesus Christ. He'll look at this topic from a different perspective than it is normally studied. We'll deal with the manner or the way Jesus will be coming back. Scripture clearly states that you and I will be able to see his coming and we'll hear his coming. There's going to be a glory connected with the second coming the world has never before seen. You'll find tonight's topic, Christ is Coming Again, to be the most interesting and helpful to you in your own personal Christian experience. Let's go at this time to the meeting and enjoy the wonderful music from the Dimensions of Prophecy team and Kenneth Cox's heartwarming presentation, Christ is Coming Again. Good morning. I'm very happy to welcome all of you this morning. If time would last long enough, the age in which we're living probably could go down in the history books a number of different ways. Some people might refer to our time as the automated age, the age in which man put wheels under himself, began to travel at speeds that he had never known before. Some historians might refer to the time that you and I have lived in as that of the jet age, an age in which man finally produced a propellant that was strong enough that it could push him beyond the gravitational pull of this earth. Other historians might refer to our age as the atomic age in which man finally broke through the barrier of the atom and then was afraid of what he found. Others might refer to our age as that of the space age, age in which man began to travel in outer space, to go to regions that he had never been in before. But probably, if time would last long enough, our age would go down in the history books as the incredible age. What a day to be alive. We've made marvelous technological advances. We've gone from muscles to missiles in one generation. Ours is a day in which we spend billions of dollars on missiles and trifles on missions. Ours is a day in which some people are discovering that there is no such thing as an easy payment plan. Ours is a day in which a man can make 20 orbits around the earth in less time than it took Lindbergh to fly across the Atlantic. Ours is a day when you can eat breakfast in London, lunch, New York City, dinner, Los Angeles, and sleep that night in Mexico City. Ours is a day when everything in the modern home is run by switches except the children. <laughs> Ours is a day which we're told that Jesus Christ is coming back. That's the time that you and I are living in, a time in which the Scripture says that the Lord is going to come back in the clouds of heaven. And what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at what the Scripture says about the manner or the way in which Jesus Christ is coming back because it's most important that you and I understand what the Scripture says about the coming of the Lord. One, I, one point I want you to get very clear in your mind is that the Bible says that the coming of Jesus Christ will be something that you and I can see. No question about it. It will be clear. We'll be able to see it. I want you to notice what the Scripture says about the coming of the Lord. John 14, verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus gave the promise that he's coming back. He's coming back to gather his people, to take them where he is, is that they may be there also. And dear friend, it's not very hard to tell where, where that means. I find some people having trouble trying to decide what that means. If you go to the 13th chapter of John, you'll find that Jesus is talking to Peter. And he makes it very clear that he was going to heaven and that he was coming back after his people. He's going to take them to be with him in heaven. And it says that as he comes in the clouds of heaven, that he will appear. It's not going to be secret. It's not going to be quiet. It's going to be something that people will know. Listen. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, and to those who eagerly wait for him, he will what? Appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So the scripture says that he is going to appear. It's something that you and I will be able to see very clear with our own eyes. There'll be no question about it. Now, the scripture tells us here in Acts 1-9, it says, And when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a what? All right, now, as we go through several texts here this morning, I want you to watch for that little word cloud. Just watch. A number of texts that mention that word cloud it says he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now, follow, because it's going to make a statement here that's important. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This what? Same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in what? like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Those disciples stood there that day and they watched as a cloud took him up and received him out of their sight. They couldn't see him anymore and they stood there and watched that happen. Dear friends, it says he's going to come back in like manner. They saw him go into heaven. The scripture says he's coming back in like manner. That means that you and I will be able to see him come will not be something that they won't be able to see. We will be able to see it clearly. It says this very same Jesus, and I'm very thankful for that, the same Jesus that blessed the children, placed them on his knee, that same Jesus is coming back. The same Jesus that spent three and a half years with the disciples that spent time with the people, talked with the people, that same Jesus is coming back. And so it's going to be something that you and I will be able to see very clearly. In fact, the scripture points out how clear we will be able to see it. And this is what it says. Concerning Jesus coming as he comes in the clouds of heaven, it says that many people will see him Behold, he is coming with what? All right, there it is again. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every what? I will see him. They also who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. amen. It says that those people that were there at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, those that laughed at him and jeered and said, if you're the Son of God, come down off the cross the soldier that stuck the spear in his side, it says those people will be resurrected for the purpose of seeing him come in the clouds of heaven. But it says all those that are alive are going to see him come. Every eye shall see him. We have an idea going across the world today that this coming of Christ is going to be something that's secret, set aside, that people won't know it. No, 10,000 times no. It says that they'll see him come in the clouds of heaven. In fact, it says it will be like lightning. Listen, what it says here in Matthew 24, 27. For as lightning comes from the east and shines to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. You ever seen it lightning like that? I remember when I was a boy, 
my father was very, very fond of hunting and fishing. And uh, we spent a lot of time together hunting and fishing. And uh, some of the most wonderful times that I remember with my father was at those times. And I can remember he came home one day from work and he told me, he said, uh, tomorrow when you get home from school, he said, I want you to get all the fishing stuff ready because uh, when I come home, we're going to pack up the car and we're going to go out to the river and uh, we're going to spend all night on the river fishing. Well, of course, that just thrilled me to death. And so I got everything all ready and we got a food all fixed up and my father got home that night and we, that evening we packed the car up, drove out to the river to fish all night. And I can remember we got out the fishing poles and everything and went down and set them out in the river there and kind of got things fixed up. And then my father went up on top of the river bank there and uh, took a hatchet and cut down some small shrubs and fixed kind of a lean-to, I guess is the best word I could use, and uh, got that all set up and spread out a blanket. And uh, if you got tired, you could go up and lay down there and sleep. And if you didn't want to sleep, you could go down and fish, you know. And we just built a campfire, and we'd just have a great time there fishing together. And I can remember we had gotten all, everything all fixed, and we were setting up there at that lean-to talking when over on the horizon you could begin to see the flash of lightning. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever lived in Oklahoma, but uh, Oklahoma has a little reputation. It's called the Tornado Alley. They seem to, you know, come right down through there. And a storm can come up there in nothing flat. I mean, just before you know it, you can be in a storm. And I can remember seeing the lightning and off in the distance I could hear the thunder. And in a little bit, the wind began to pick up. Well, boy, that storm came right across where we were. I mean, just right there. I have never in my life before or since that day have seen it lightning like it did that night. I, I just never have. It would light when it would light. The lightning would absolutely be so bad that you could read. I mean, it would light it up like daylight. I was scared to death. I remember I got as close to my father as I could, and I shut my eyes, and I could still see the lightning. And dear friend, when it says, as it cometh out of the east and shineth under the west, you better believe you can see that. No trouble seeing it. It says this is the way the coming of Christ will be. It'll be something that we will see without any question. It goes on and tells us about the coming of the Lord. It tells us that here, and then shall the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the... There it is again on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It says the wicked are going to know that he's coming. I run on to these people that seem to think that the wicked are going to say, well, you know, what happened? That isn't what it says. It says they're going to see him come. It says they're going to mourn because of it. He's going to come with power, great, great glory. So it's not something that you and I won't know is taking place. In fact, it tells us this, about these clouds. You know, we've talked about these clouds. You see, what's it been? Oh, 15, maybe longer than that, 20 years ago, when there was such a great big to-do over UFOs and uh, flying saucers and all that. Do you remember that? Well, when that first came out, well... Uh, I got my hands on every book I could get my hands on and I read everything I could find about UFOs and flying saucers and all this and uh, I found out that there's a religion connected to that. I found out that there are people that believe that the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel by night, they believe that was a flying saucer. They believe there in Ezekiel where it talks about a wheel within a wheel and all that. They believe that was flying saucers. They believe that Jesus came to the earth on a flying saucer. They believe that the cloud that received him out of their sight was a flying saucer. 
They believe that he's coming back on a flying saucer. Well, this morning, I'd like to tell you what those clouds are because this is what the scripture says. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters who makes the clouds his what? Chariots who walks on the wings of the wind. Fantastic text. It says that God walks on the wings of the wind. It says that the clouds are his chariots. Now, follow very carefully because this is what it says in Psalms. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of what? Angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. So it says that the clouds are God's chariots, and it says the chariots of God are his what? Angels. You see, when it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, it means all the angelic hosts that are in heaven are going to come with him. When it says that a cloud received him out of their sight, that was all the angels that came to welcome the Redeemer back to heaven. Have you ever read there in the book of Psalms about the welcome of Christ? You ever read about that? Where it says that they come to the very gates of heaven and they say, Oh, gates of Jerusalem, open the gates. The King of glory is coming. As they welcome back all the angelic hosts, just think, as they welcome Christ back. That's what it's talking about when it says a cloud received him out of their sight and all the angels that are going to come and the clouds of heaven with Jesus Christ. This is what those clouds are. Not some flying saucer, not some UFO, dear friend, but the angels of God. Then it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Not only will the coming of Jesus Christ be something that you and I will be able to see, but the coming of Jesus Christ is something that you can hear. No question about it. It says that Jesus is going to come with what? A shout. That's not quiet. I mean, when you shout, that's not quiet. And it says that he's going to come and he's going to shout. And when he shouts, his voice is going to roll through this earth like peals of the loudest thunder. You better believe people will know that he is coming. No question about it. It'll be very, very clear. Listen. It says, and he will send his angels with the great sound of the trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And so it says that those angels are going to come and they're going to sound that trumpet. And boy, when they sound that trumpet, it will rumble this whole earth. It says he's going to send his angels to gather his elect from the four ends of the earth. Did you know that the Bible says that each one of you have an angel? Did you know that? That you have an angel, that angel goes with you throughout your entire life. I've heard some people say, well, now don't go to the wrong places because if you do, your angel won't go with you. Be careful. Be careful. That isn't necessarily what it's saying. There is an aspect about that that you ought to consider real, real careful. It doesn't say necessarily about your angel not going with you. It says that that angel keeps record, writes everything you do down. That you ought to consider. That you ought to be concerned about. It's all kept, the record. But that angel is going to, goes with you throughout your entire life. That angel knows you by name. Do you have any problem with that? Any of you not believe that? Oh, the Bible says that your angel looks upon the face of God. That's what it says. Do you remember Peter? Remember he's in this prison? You remember they're going to cut his head off? Do you remember that? And God sent an angel down there and opened the prison doors and Peter come walking out. You know, when that angel got down there, it says that they had put him between, behind three locked doors 
and they had, with guards on both sides, and they had t chained him between two guards. And the next morning, they were going to cut his head off. Do you know what Peter was doing? Huh? You know what he was doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. How many of you would be asleep if your head was coming off the next morning? He was sleeping. Angel came down and it says the angel had to shake him. said, get up, Peter. And Peter thought he was having a dream. You read the story there. The angel finally had to say, Peter, put your shoes on. I mean, here he is dreaming. And finally the angel takes him out in the street. And then the angel leaves. And finally Peter realizes this isn't a dream. And you remember he goes over to the home of John Mark. You remember that? Knocks on the door. And a young girl by the name of Rhoda comes to the door and she looks out there and there's Peter and she gets so excited that Peter's there. She runs back in the house. She doesn't open the door and she tells all the people, Peter's out there. Peter's at the door. And they said, no, nah, he's not. And she said, yes, yes, Peter's there. And they said to Rhoda's parents, is she okay? You know, is she all right? And she said, no, Peter's at the door. Read it in the book of Acts. And the people said to her, it's his angel. Every one of us have an angel, and on the resurrection morning, that angel is going to come and get you and take you to present you to the Lord. Just think of what it's going to be able to be to look upon that angel that knows you better than anybody else. I mean, that angel knows more about you and is more acquainted with you than any other individual on this earth. It's going to come, welcome you, present you, gather his elect from the four ends of the earth. Not be something that will be quiet. There will be a rejoicing like this world has never known before. Talks about the resurrection Jesus comes. Did you know that the Bible tells us the exact words that Jesus is going to say when he comes? Did you know that? That when he comes in the clouds of heaven and it says that he's going to shout, it tells you exactly what he's going to say. Listen, this is what it says in the book of Isaiah. Your dead shall live together with my dead body they shall rise. And this is what Jesus is going to shout. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. Just think as he comes and he shouts out across this whole earth, Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust. And boy, those words will roll through this earth and all the dead that are in their graves will hear those voices, hear those words, and they'll come out of the grave. For your, for your dew is like the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. Boy, those graves are going to pop open. And the righteous are going to come out of there. The old devil is held. He's held God's people captive as long as he can. Death has been victorious. Death has been broken. Christ has been victorious. And it says that as they come out of that grave, it even tells you what the righteous are going to sing. Find it in Corinthians. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, or grave, where is your victory? The righteous is going to come out singing. That's not quiet, friend. That's not quiet at all. It's going to be a rejoicing like this world has never heard before as the righteous come forth. Not only is it going to be something that we can see, something we can hear, but it also says there's going to be a glory connected with it like man has never seen before. I mean, you talk about things changing. I want you to listen to what it says here in the book of Revelation. The sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island removed out of its place. That's not something that's normal. You see, when these old heavens up here split right down the middle, and they roll back like a scroll, you better believe people know something's going on. When the mountains begin to move and the islands start disappearing, 
and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the commanders and the mighty men and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains. They know something's going on. They're well aware of it and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So it says that the wicked are going to be very, very much aware of the coming of the Lord going to cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them, hide them from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Why? Why from the face of him that sitteth on the throne? Listen, Christ made something real clear when he was here about his coming. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words... Of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father and of the holy angels. Did you get that? says that when he comes, he's coming in his own glory, he's coming in his Father's glory, and he's coming in the glory of the holy angels. That's what that text says. Have you ever considered that? Let me just give you a couple examples. Do you remember when Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and they went up to the Mount of Transfiguration? And there, while he is praying, all of a sudden Moses and Elijah appeared. And it says that while Moses and Elijah was there talking to Christ, it says that his face shone like the sun. You remember? down there at the crucifixion, just before at the Garden of Gethsemane, when the mob has come up there, and Judas has come over and kissed him on the cheek, and the mob has grabbed him, and all of a sudden Peter pulls the sword and cuts off that servant's ear. And you remember Christ wanted to do something, and they wouldn't turn him loose. And all of a sudden, the glory of Christ shone forth, and it says that entire mob fell like dead men. And I hope you're getting to get a little bit of the picture of the glory of Christ. Not only says that he will come in his own glory, it says that he's going to come in the glory of his Father. The Lord has told Moses to come up into the mountain. Moses has gone up there and he spent 40 days talking with God. That 40 days comes to an end. And Moses said, Lord, I'd like to see your face. And the Lord said, no, Moses, no man has seen my face and lived. He said, but I'll tell you what, I'll put you over here in the crevice of the rock and I'll put my hand over it, and I'll pass by, and then I'll remove my hand, and you can see my back. And so God put Moses in the rock, covered him there with his hand, and then he removed it. And Moses saw the back of God, and it says that he saw love and mercy and compassion and long-suffering he saw all the marvelous attributes of God. Moses is now on his way down back to the camp of Israel. As he gets on the outskirts of the camp, all of a sudden some of the men of Israel come running out there and they said, Moses, Moses, put a veil over your face. We can't stand to look upon you. Now, dear friend, let me tell you something. If the reflected glory is so bright that man can't stand to look upon it, think of what it's going to be when Jesus comes in the glory of his Father. And then it says he's going to come in the glory of the holy angels. It's the resurrection. It's night. They have put Christ in the tomb. They have sealed the tomb. Not only have they sealed the tomb, they've put a centurion there to guard it. That means a man that has a hundred soldiers under him. And behold, there was a great earthquake. 
For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Angel came, rolled back that stone, sat down on it. Now listen, we're talking about one angel. His countenance was like lightning. <laughs> One angel. His countenance was like lightning. His clothing is white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. I mean, these are soldiers, soldiers that are committed to fight to death. And they shake and fall like dead men at the presence of one angel. All right, now follow. And I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Nowhere in this book does it number angels. God never numbers angels. That's the closest you'll ever find to it. It says there was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. It calls them an innumerable company. But do you know what 10,000 times 10,000 is? Well, that's 100 million now, you just think of what it's going to be when a hundred million angels come and each of them's face is like lightning. You talk about a glory. There'll be a glory connected there like man has never seen. I can tell you right now, dear friend, the only way human beings will survive that is if you're very, very much in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he is my rock. He is my fortress. In his arms, under his wings, I shall abide. That's the way we'll make it. There'll be a glory there like man has never known before. Jesus comes. A friend of mine was over in the Middle East had spent several days there. The next day he was to leave to catch a plane. His plane was to leave about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was 8 miles from the city out to the airport. And he decided that he would get up early that morning, pack his stuff and go out to the airport and check his baggage in and everything uh, because it always takes a while to go through customs and get all that done. And then he would just go over somewhere there in the airport and sit down and write. He needed to do some writing. And so he got up early that morning, packed all of his stuff up. The taxi service that ran from the hotels in the city to the airport in Jordan, this happened to be in the country of Jordan, drive black Cadillacs. That's what the taxis are, black Cadillacs. And so he went out and got himself a taxi, and they loaded his stuff into the Cadillac and took him out to the airport. So he went in and checked in his baggage and went through customs and got all that done. And when he got through, he walked over to where one of the policemen standing and he said, how come there's so much security? Why are there so many cops around? Why, why all the security? And the policeman said to him, haven't you heard? And he said, no. He said, King Hussein's coming in said his planes do in just a little bit. And my friend said, ah, this is an excellent opportunity for me to get some pictures. Got his camera, got outside and found him a good location where he could see clearly and could take pictures. And he said, uh, wasn't too long that he could notice that the security was beginning to tighten up more. And then he said they could hear the drone of the engine of the plane said to begin to look and pretty soon they could see the plane as it began to circle prepare for the landing landing plane came in landed 
taxied up there and he got himself all situated right behind the fence there so he could get some good pictures and when the plane taxied up there and stopped he said some men came out and they rode out all the way to the plane a red carpet said then stairs were put down and all and the door of the plane opened and a guard came out said that guard looked everything open over very carefully stood there while the dignitaries came and they all came and they lined up on both sides of the red carpet and said when that guard was satisfied that everything was safe he went back in the plane and he said in just a few moments out came king hussein said he was shooting pictures all the time of everything king hussein came down the steps and as they do over there in the middle east they began he began to embrace the dignitaries on both sides of the red carpet as he greeted him going down and he said while he was shooting all the pictures he happened to turn around and look behind him and there in the front of the airport was lined up four black cadillacs to take king and his king hussein and his party into town to the palace and he said all of a sudden he had a bright idea and he said he took the pictures he needed put his camera in the case and he went over to where one of those taxi cabs were black Cadillacs and he got in that taxi cab and he told that taxi cab driver he said you see those four black Cadillacs he said when they pull off I want you to pull in right behind them and I want you to follow them all the way into town so he said he got in the taxi cab and he said in just a moment King Hussein came out and he got in the first one and then his party got in the rest of the other three and he said they pulled off and headed for town and his taxi cab driver pulled up right behind him and they all headed down the road he said on both side of the road the full eight miles into town people were lined up to see the king and he said they were all waving and shouting as the king passed and he said he sat back there in his black Cadillac and waved at everybody and smiled he said oh it was so nice to be part of the king's party he said they got into town he said that the sidewalk was four abreast four abreast with people throwing confetti waving at the king and he said he just sat back there and it was so nice to be part of the king's party he just waved at everybody he said he never enjoyed anything anymore in his life said finally they got down the street and they turned and he said way up at the other end of the street he could see the palace said as they got closer he could see the gates and he said as they got a little closer he could see the guards standing on both sides of the gates he said a little bit that first Cadillac got up there and it said it stopped and those two great big old guards bent over and looked at each person in the car waved it on through the next Cadillac pulled up and they looked at each person waved them on through and he said he reached up and tapped his taxi cab driver on the shoulder and said pull off this as far as we can go how is it with you friend are you part of the king's party are you a child of the king or are you just going along for the ride if Jesus was to come would you say well <laughs> sorry this is as far as I can go I'm going to have to pull off here. Can't go any farther. Do you belong to the king? Are you his child? Are you a child of the king? It's what counts. It's what makes the difference. That you belong to him. This morning, I want you to listen very carefully as Steve sings.